evening and welcome to History Makers 2008. And now, let's welcome our History Makers. Please welcome first, Barbara Barrett. Joel Garagiola, accompanied by wife, Audrey. I'm blind as a bat up here, Joe, without my cowboy hat. Ed Mel, accompanied by wife, Rose Marie. Elizabeth, better known to her old friends as Betty Ruffner, accompanied by her son, George. Alice, better known by her old friends as D Dickie, and her husband, well, Richard Snell. I was, um, I was looking around the crowd tonight, both at the social hour and the cocktail hour, and then in here, and I, it, it, it reminded me so much of the uh, many high school reunions that I've emceed lately. Um, you're a little older, but uh, still, um, uh, still, you've still got it. Uh, it's been said, we make a living by what we get, and we make a life by what we give. And tonight, we're here to honor six Arizonans whose lives and achievements are the manifestation of those words. But first, let me introduce the Reverend Bud Peltier, Vicar of Stewardship at Phoenix Catholic Diocese. Bud. I am Father Bud Pelletier. I am a priest, a native Arizonan, and the Vicar of Stewardship for the Diocese of Phoenix. Bishop Olmsted tonight sends his greetings to us from the Diocese of Gallup, New Mexico, where he is currently assisting three days a week as that bishop recovers from very serious injuries. As a vicar, I stand with the bishop when he is available, and I stand as the bishop in the areas of stewardship in our diocese. Stewardship is about the wise use of our God-given lives, and tonight we honor those who have shown us exceptional stewardship. So let us pray. God and creator of us all, we gather tonight to ask your continued blessings on those whom we honor. They have shared their lives with us to better our state and world. We also ask your guidance and blessings for all of us so that we may bring your peace and love to all. Bless this meal that it may strengthen us. We ask this through gratitude for all we have received. Amen. Hello, everybody. Let us propose a toast to the History Makers 2008. A toast.
Well, in the not too distant future, four years from now, we'll be toasting the 100th birthday of the great state of Arizona. We are truly all Arizonans, and we are all truly proud to think of our state as a land of anomalies and tamales. We have birds that run faster than they fly, flowers that only bloom at night. Sometimes we even have the hottest and the coldest national temperatures here on the same date. Uh, we're a land of contradictions. Um, the lost Dutchman was really a German. The gunfight at OK Corral wasn't fought at the OK Corral. It was fought on lot two, block 17, between the Harwood House and Fly's Photograph Gallery on 4th and Fremont Street in Tombstone. That doesn't look too good on the cover of a book or a movie uh, marquee, I guess. So gunfight at OK Corral works for me. But if you ever do go down there, they do have a beauty salon, ladies, there that's called the Curl Up and Die. Um, world famous Montezuma Castle is, um, uh, it, we, it was first thought, it was given that name by the local pioneers in the Verde Valley when uh, they thought that such a magnificent structure uh, must have been the home of Montezuma on the way uh, to Mexico City a long time ago. Turns out in reality though that um, that city had been abandoned a hundred years before old Montezuma was even born. And um, the town of, Par uh, pa or the, uh, the, not the town of Paradise Valley, uh, uh, Paradise Valley, the Pleasant Valley War uh, in uh, Pleasant Valley, Arizona, I meant to say, is, uh, is the land uh, where uh, made famous a little place called Pleasant Valley of the most notorious and bloody feud in the history of the American West. Um, Another little oddity about Arizona that we haven't seen yet, but um, it very well, uh, Cornville, Arizona could very well be the summer White House <laughs> by next year. Imagine that. What's the press going to do with that? They've already been calling me about it and uh, wanting to know the history of Cornville. Uh, gives me a chance to tell them some Ash Fork stories, though. Um, I wished I'd have known John was going to go to Cornville. I'd have said, I just suggested he go to Ash Fork. Um, Arizona, uh, the, first, the, the first cowboy movie star um, from Arizona was a girl. Her name was Dorothy Faye Southworth from Prescott, Arizona. She was the daughter of a prominent physician up there, and her mother was a colorful character named Harriet who drove stripped down cars in, in races. She once went, ran a road race from Prescott to Phoenix and beat all men in 1908 in a stripped down car. She made it from Prescott to Phoenix. She made it from Prescott to Phoenix in six hours and 31 minutes. <laughs> uh, that's better time than sometimes you can make it today on the I-17. <laughs> the first white man to come to Arizona was a black man. Go figure. Um, he was a reconnaissance scout for the Coronado Expedition way back in 1539. We have some county anomalies too. We have the town of Gila Bend. It's in Maricopa County. And we have a town called Maricopa, but it's not Maricopa County. Uh, it's in Pinal County. And down along the railroad tracks, there's a little place there called Pinal, but it's not Pinal County, it's in Gila County. <laughs> we have a town called Graham, or excuse me, Pima, it's in Graham County. And, um, and we also have a town called Fort Apache. Not in Apache County. It's in Navajo County. We have a town called Navajo, Arizona. Uh, guess where it is? Apache County. Now you're starting to get it. OK. I think we just like to keep the visitors confused. In 1911, we just completed the, uh, the magnificent Theodore Roosevelt Dam which would ensure the future with the Salt River Project to ensure the future of the lifestyle we enjoy here today, uh, here in the Valley. And in 1911, when they dedicated it, former President Teddy Roosevelt um, came to the dedication. Afterwards, he uh, stopped at the campus, the college campus at Tempe, and standing on the front steps of Old Main, uh, he predicted that with a magnificent growth that Phoenix would enjoy now with the Salt River Project, 
the, and the dams on the rivers that uh, uh, in the future, Phoenix would one day have 100,000 people here in the valley. Um, it wasn't nearly as off as the prediction in 1912 when um, Arizona became a state and some pundit back in Washington predicted that this was such a backwater place full of outlaws, cattle rustlers, wild Apache, scorpions and rattlesnakes, and hot desiccating heat in the desert, said it'll be at least 100 years before Arizona sends anybody to Washington, D.C. who will make a difference back there. <laughs> we immediately sent him a, a plain-spoken sheriff of Maricopa County named Carl Hayden. Went on to serve longer in Congress than any other, any other man in history. <laughs> there were others in between, but the next big one was Ernest W. McFarland, the father of the GI Bill one of the greatest piece of pieces of legislation this country has ever passed, and was Senate Majority Leader. And he was followed by Barry Goldwater, 1952. And with Barry that year going into Congress was John Rhodes. And along the line in, in the 1960s, uh, Stuart Udall, in Congress from Arizona became the first cabinet member from Arizona. Later on, Bruce Babbitt, former governor of Arizona, would be in the cabinet. Sent some great people. We sent Paul Fannin. We sent um, uh, William Rehnquist, even, uh, from, from Phoenix. And then later, maybe, our, maybe one of the greatest of all and a good friend, Sandra Day O'Connor. And who knows, who knows, next we may have the President of the United States. What do you think? I noticed a lot of you were taking notes out there, so I will give you credit for Arizona History 101 for all that. <laughs> now I would like to, I would like to introduce, and they, they dared me, they said they would kill me if I made them come up here, so, um, or they would get even. And you know what? That's like when a woman says she'll get even. Um, uh, so I will introduce to you now. Uh, could we bring the lights up now, Mike? <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Mike. Um, Mary Parker, Historical League President. Mary? <laughs> Wave, Mary, so I can see you. OK. Please remain standing, Mary. <laughs> Terry Sanford. Terry Sanford. <laughs> Nancy Evans. Y'all remain standing now. Dolores Tomasek. They are the gala co-chairs. Let's give them a round of applause. I've got them standing so they can receive their gifts, and um, we thank you all very much, ladies, for putting on such a wonderful program tonight. Uh, Joe Garagiola has an old friend who, uh, who probably needs no introduction, and he could not make it tonight, but um, when I was a kid growing up in Ash Fork, uh, our better his, the best history lessons, well, I was only interested in baseball and girls, but um, uh, in, in, in baseball, they had comic books on your heroes. There was Phil Rizzuto and Roy Campanella and Don Newcomb and um, a fellow by the name of Yogi Berra. And I was a catcher uh, for uh, the Ash Fork team and so I always was interested in catchers, and I knew all the catchers in the big leagues. But I, was, I just devoured that book on the history of Yogi Berra, and I saw the most interesting thing because I thought, who's this, who's this playmate of his, Joe Garagiola? They grew up in St. Louis there in the immigrant section of St. Louis. And then, and then the comic book. They went to, um, 
uh, they went to a tryout. The St. Louis Cardinals had a tryout. And, um, and when the tryout was over, they sent Yogi home and they signed Joe. And then Joe went off to the minor leagues and went off to the Army and, well, you know the rest of the story. He came back uh, to become a star catcher, a, a, a rookie as a rookie, a star in the 1946 World Series when the Cardinals beat the Red Sox. And in the pivotal game of that series, uh, Joe had, I believe, three for four that day. Anyway, great baseball player he was, but I remember thinking, uh, how did the Cardinals take, uh, take Joe and, and not see something in old Yogi? Well, anyway, I think Joe, Joe straightened me out on that tonight because I said, Joe, I asked him tonight, I said, Joe, is that the way it really happened? And he said, well, Marshall, I've got to tell you the rest of the story. So I'm hoping in a, little, in a few minutes when Joe comes up, he'll tell you the rest of the story. But for right now, we're going to have a word here uh, uh, via, uh, via the camera by uh, 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 old Yogi Berra, the, the great Yogi. Joe, I'm sorry I can't make you think a uh, big dinner tonight. A history maker, huh? How'd you become a history maker? I wish I was there, really there, but I'll be down in spring training. Yogi is a man of few words. <laughs> uh, they, will be quoting, they will be quoting Yogi Berra long after they're quoting most great uh, American politicians, I do guarantee. We are now ready for the History Makers Video Awards and our first 2008 History Maker. Born in Pennsylvania, Barbara Barrett grew up inspired by her father's stories about his adventures as an Arizona cowboy. During the, the Depression, uh, he dropped out of high school, ran away from home, and came out west to be a cowboy. Worked for ranchers and was a cowboy in the Kingman, Prescott, um, Baghdad, Arizona areas. And joined the service in Prescott, Arizona. Was hurt during the war. They put him in the hospital in Pennsylvania, which is where he met my mother married, settled down, and raised six kids. But he raised us telling us great stories about Arizona. We lived on a small farm, it was a, basically a subsistence farm. When I was 13, my father passed away. He uh, had a heart attack and fell off the horse and was gone. So all of a sudden, things changed a great deal. So I was pretty much raising two younger sisters and running the farm and providing the income for uh, six kids and my mother, uh, four of us being at home. Always through our youth it was important that we go to college. My father had instilled in us the importance, the urgency of getting a good college education. And my father's affection for Arizona and the alphabetical order listing of colleges had me strike upon the idea of going to Arizona to go to college. Though I'd never been west of Aliquippa, Pennsylvania at that time, but I was destined to come to Arizona. Working her way through school, she found Arizona to be a land of opportunity. So I worked in Arizona as many as five jobs at a time to continue to provide my own support and pay my uh, room board tuition, out of state tuition. I worked at the state legislature, I worked at the bookstore, I worked writing resumes, I babysat. To get to all those jobs, Barbara rode a motorcycle. So I was well known by many of my colleagues for arriving on a motorcycle and then running into the ladies room, changing into office proper attire. During an internship at the state legislature, Barbara drafted transportation legislation and met community leaders. I had the privilege of working with such superstars as Sandra Day O'Connor and uh, Bill Jaquin, Jim McNulty, Burt Barr, Stan Akers. It was an extraordinary time in state government. Our governor was Jack Williams, spoke with interns, talked to us about the, the goal, the obligation, the mission, the selflessness of being uh, a political office holder. That has stuck with me. They also encouraged her to go to law school. Barbara earned her law degree at ASU. I also worked during law school, so I go to law school in the mornings, go downtown and work at law firms or eventually at the Greyhound Corporation, which was headquartered here at the time. After getting her law degree, Barbara decided to pursue another goal. So I thought that 
if I'm ever going to get my pilot's license, I'm just going to have to layer it on top of other things. Flying had always been an aspiration of mine, and as, as aviation beca became more and more a part of my professional life, it became more and more helpful to me to have that pilot's license. Barbara became friends with fellow pilot Barry Goldwater and pursued her interest in politics and community service. Through Valley Leadership, I found myself flying around the state with Barry Goldwater as he gave speeches in Bullhead City and Kingman, Arizona. And, and for me, the privilege of flying Arizona with him, of hearing his stories and his motivations, and understanding the joy that he got uh, from seeing his state prosper something that was really instructive to me. In 1983, President Reagan appointed Barbara Barrett to serve on the Civil Aeronautics Board. And I uh, was especially honored to have him host my swearing in to the Civil Aeronautics Board role where Sandra O'Connor administered the oath and Elizabeth Dole held the Bible. So it was a special, very special occasion. Barbara Barrett was often the lone woman among international aviation leaders. In fact, her career has been marked by first. She was appointed by President Reagan to be the first woman deputy director of the Federal Aviation Administration. So aviation continued to be a big part of my life, both as the economic regulator and then at the FAA as the, the safety and security regulator. In the late 80s and early 90s, there was a move by military women and others to allow women the privilege and responsibility of flying fighter and bomber aircraft. One admiral who was the father of daughters thought that maybe women could do these things. So he knew that I was a pilot and asked me if I would want to fly um, a fighter. Well, I had flown at A7s and uh, F8, F16s. It took no time at all for me to say that, yes, of course, I'd be delighted to fly an F18s. But I didn't know at the time that no a civilian woman had flown an F18 and landed on a carrier. The whole experience was exciting. The best part is that it was, in the end, effective, and that now women are flying F18s routinely. Women are landing on aircraft carriers routinely. Barbara Barrett was also the first Republican woman to run for governor of Arizona. You know, it was an extraordinary time in Arizona history, uh, then 1993 and 1994. We were going through a lot of strife. I was persuaded, and, and I'm persuaded today, that it was really important to have a challenge in that race, for there to be more than one Republican candidate on the ticket for people to choose between. It wasn't successful in winning the governorship, but it was highly successful in winning friendships and, and making a statement that, um, that Arizona values integrity. In recent years, Barbara Barrett has focused on international issues. In 2006, she represented the United States at the UN. I spoke on a passion of mine is the uh, role of women in the world. I chair the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. It's a an advisory team to Secretary of State Colin Powell earlier and now Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. There is plenty to do in the field of public diplomacy these days. With the internet and with ease of communications in much of the world, uh, everything is much more transparent than it used to be. But it is uh, very important that we get a fair representation of America. Barbara is also on the U.S. Afghan Women's Council, where she became a driving force behind Thunderbird School of Global Management's Project Artemis, a mentorship program for Afghan women entrepreneurs. Working to find ways of empowering women from the, especially the developing world uh, so that they can meet their basic needs. We find that as women achieve some level of financial success, they're far more likely to invest that in their children. I have consider education the ticket to opportunity. So Arizona State University was why I came here and we've worked, uh, both Craig and I have worked to um, try to help Arizona State University as it changes in character and grows and uh, excels in its category. At ASU, construction has begun on the Craig and Barbara Barrett Honors College. It's a great life changer 
for young people who have academic capability. So the Honors College gives an Ivy level education, Ivy League type education in a setting in the Arizona sun. Barbara's love of the outdoors has thrived in Arizona. I know Arizona by air, having flown to many of the four corners of our state. And I know it by foot, by hiking into some of those places that are only accessible by foot. My husband and I met at the top of what's now called Paestua Peak. We were hiking on a hot July day. There weren't many people out on Squaw Peak at that time of day, but that's how Craig and I first met. Her career has taken her around the world, but Barbara Barrett always calls Arizona home. But I thought I would only come, spend a semester, see this place, and then get back home to Pennsylvania where I thought my destiny would be. But wonderful jobs and extraordinary people and, um, and a sunrise that grows on you led to my wanting to be here forever. Ladies and gentlemen, Barbara Barrett. Thank you, Marshall, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You know, it is a great state to live in Arizona. Don't you think so? It is the people, the character of this state, the rugged individualism, the make it happen, make it work nature of Arizona that brought me here, that keeps me here, and makes me want to always be here. Thank you very much. This is a very meaningful moment in my life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Barbara. Thank wait you wait much. just a minute. We are presenting each history maker tonight with a photo, framed photo, nicely framed photo of, uh, of the photograph you see up here. But I also wanted to mention Barbara was just recently appointed the ambassador to Finland by the President of the United States. But all we need is some Senate confirmation and I might go Well, there. you'll make it, you'll make it. <laughs> uh, and the reason that wasn't on the film is it happened after we had already put the film together, so, so that's why it's not there. I wanted to say one other thing, Barbara, and I think I, I already told you this another time when we were on the Bo Barry Goldwater lecture series together, but she told that story about meeting Craig uh, up at the top of the peak and um, I contemplated, thought about that for a long time. And for the next four years, I walked up there every day hoping to meet a Barbara Barrett. And I, I got in great shape, but I had no luck. <laughs> thank you very much. God bless. My and good luck. And good luck. Oh, thank you. That, that's for you. Thanks so very much. And now, let's meet our next history maker. My name is Joe Garagiola, and uh, it's, uh, it's been mangled quite a bit, and, but uh, some people insist that it's Garagiola, and that's not the way Papa said it, so uh, I have maintained Garagiola, Joe Garagiola. Hi, Joe! Joe Garagiola dreamed of becoming a baseball player as he grew up in a St. Louis Italian community called The Hill. This is a same Joe Garagiola who now helps make dreams come true for kids growing up at St. Peter Indian Mission School in Arizona's Gila River Indian community. Well, my father and mother were immigrants. My father was a, uh, uh, a laborer. Papa was a hard worker. Uh, my father uh, just kept trying. My sweet mother, God rest her soul, 
she, uh, she never did become a citizen, and it's pretty well known fact that uh, Yogi and I grew up across the street, Yogi Berra, and you always dreamed about being a baseball player. Well, I think all kids do. You know, we say, oh yeah, I'm gonna be a baseball player. I'm gonna play for the St. Louis Cardinals, the hometown team. Joe and Yogi played Sandlot baseball with neighborhood kids, unaware they were being watched. But there was a man that always sat in the stands watching us play. And it ended up, he was what was known in those days as a bird dog. He worked with the scout and he would tell the scout, hey, you ought to see this kid, he can play. And they said, would you like to try out uh, and work out with the Cardinals? Lord, yes, that was our dream. The dream came true in 1946. After a few years in the minor leagues and a stint in the Army, Joe Garagiola joined the St. Louis Cardinals as a catcher in time to play in a World Series. As we played the Boston Red Sox, I had never seen Ted Williams live. And there was no television. And we'd hear about these guys, you know, uh, and, and when Williams came up to hit the first time, I was awestruck. I was catching in a World Series and I'm looking up at him and I'm saying, this is the great Ted Williams. Joe went on to play for Pittsburgh, for the Cubs and for the Giants but an earlier shoulder injury shortened his major league career. However, that closed door only opened another door, a second career in broadcasting. I've been blessed, like when I did The Tonight Show and filled in for Johnny Carson. Who's my first guest? The Beatles. Garagiola's broadcast career spanned 40 years. It was towards the end of that period of his life that Joe and his wife Audrey decided to make Arizona their new home. Uh, I said, Let, let's move to Phoenix. He said, well, let's go look at it, but we're not going to go in December and January and February when it looks like the Garden of Eden. We're going to go in July and August. And I said, what? And she said, well, the heat. And I'll never forget getting, I was doing Game of the Week at the time. When I came back, I was anxious to get a reaction. I stepped off the plane and I said, what do you think, sweetheart? And she says, I'm going to die here. I'll never make it. It's too hot. But what really sold us is that we found a little house over on the Royal Verde. And uh, the neighbors were so great. And it was the people. It is here in Arizona that a new door opened for Joe. He discovered the St. Peter Indian Mission School, a place that would become his mission. A mission that began when he took some baseball equipment to St. Peter's and met Sister Martha. And so I said to her, what's your number one priority here? And I thought she was gonna say computers or this or that. She said a basketball court. I said, a basketball court? You're a nun. She's supposed to tell me computers and, and things. She said, no, basketball court. I said, why? She said, if we had a basketball court there, the kids could come back and play. They would enjoy it. Different things have happened. We've done different things, and I've even changed the name of it. I call it uh, the parish of Our Lady of Quicksand. Once you get in it, you can't get out. <laughs> You're always doing something. And uh, our kids, when they see this, this is the library. I just could not imagine a school not having a library uh, where kids could, could really come and study and, 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 and have a library. The new library at St. Peter's happened because of Joe Garagiola's vision for the mission and its kids. This is the way Joe works to make the mission whole. Whether it's the basketball court or the church, he enlists the help of anyone he can buttonhole, including the owner of Tempe Decorating Center. So we go to this uh, restaurant in Tempe, and he says, okay, what do you, what do you, whatever you need, you, you get. I said, I need a lot of things. I said, first of all, I need eight floors in the classrooms because the termites are eating us out of it. He looks at me and he says, um, do I have to take the floors out? I said, no, we'll take the floors out. He said, okay, can we eat? I said, no, not yet. He said, what do you need now? I said, the church, I need indoor, outdoor carpeting down the center aisle, on the altar and in the sacristy. He says, um, okay, got it, let's eat. 
I said, I'm not finished yet. So he says, uh, what do you need now? I said, this convent that the nuns got, one room is green carpet, one is red carpet, one is blue carpet. I want, I don't care how many come down there, but they come down and they pick the carpet they want and you do all the rooms the same carpet. So he's got two who are salesmen from the carpet company and he says, you guys help me? And they said, yeah. He said, okay, you got it, can we eat? I said, yeah, now we can eat. You would have told me I would have been able to be part of this. I would have said, what are you, nuts? I don't need that. But God works in strange ways. We have the prayer. Uh, Lord, uh, teach us to know that every day down every street come chances to be God's hands and feet. Our kids say that after school every day. Be God's hands and feet, which is a lesson for all of us to learn. Well, I tell our guys, look, you're as good as anybody. You may not have, you, life is a race. And the guy next to you may be in Nike shoes, Nike shorts, Nike tank top. And here you are, you probably got old shoes on, and blue jeans, and maybe your shirt is on and it's torn or you don't even have one. That's okay, you may have to run harder but you're in the race. You got a chance just like everybody else. And the only thing that, that, that I, I tell them is don't compromise. Hold on to a dream. My dream was to be a major league baseball player. And I was able to, to fulfill that dream. And then a lot of nice things happened. I tell the kids, don't let anybody talk you out of that dream. Turn those lights down, because I'm bald. <laughs> you haven't noticed it. I don't know what to say, but I want to tell you, they didn't know it, but I'm going to make a confession. I've had a lot of great things happen in my life, but you know what my biggest ambition is? Is to catch a nun chewing gum in line. <laughs> Let me... Uh, Marshall talked about that story quickly to, uh, so you don't go home in suspense. Mr. Ricky was the general manager. He knew what he was doing when he signed me and didn't sign Yogi. He was saving him for Brooklyn. He really was. That story, a lot of people think that, oh, you were a better player than Yogi. No way. I mean, uh, when you go to the big leagues, you're either the best player in high school or maybe all city, all state. I wasn't even the best player on my block. So uh, th that's the story of that. And if you know Yogi, uh, I mean, uh, he's not a funny guy. He doesn't tell funny stories, but he'll say something. I'm gonna tell you one tonight, well, uh, quickly. Uh, I mean, if he walked in that door right now and you said to him, Yo, what time is it? Now? <laughs> no, I'll wait 15 minutes and subtract it, you know? Uh, he, he does things like that. Uh, he's driving a jalopy car, as all kids had one time. And uh, uh, it was winter time. He hit the brakes, skidded on the ice, hit the fire plug. We got old faithful in the neighborhood. Water shooting 50 feet high. Cops are there, everything. And, and when it kind of settled down, I said, Yo, what happened? He said, You know what happened. I put the brakes on, I slipped on the ice with the car. And the horn didn't work. I said, what do you expect? You blow the horn, the fire plug moves? But, but, but that's him. Uh, I'm going to quote him. I, I brought a little speech with me because uh, I, I, this, this is difficult for me. It really is. Um, I'm going to quote him because I, I wrote a book which is out and it's doing with a lot of help pretty doggone good, and it's going to help a lot of kids, okay? Having said that, I called him. I said, yo, you got to write the foreword. What do you want me to say? I said, when we were kids, some of the things that, you know, we did. 
Well, I'll tell you, before I say anything, I want to tell you something. Before I say anything, I want to tell you something. I promise you, tomorrow at 9.30, you're going to say, what did he say? Before, but anyhow, I, I, before I start, and, and Barbara Barrett, man, was, I imp was that some video? And what a lady, huh? Congratulations. <laughs> Man, Barbara, I take back some of the way I was talking to you, I tell you. <laughs> if I'd have known that, I'd have been sucking up to you. <laughs> but I would, that, that's just tremendous. But anyhow, uh, I want to be like Yogi. I want to, before I say anything, I want to tell you something. <laughs> I want to thank all the ladies for the hard work of putting this together. You have no idea. I have never, and I've done a tremendous amount of banquets, as you know, because I work cheap. And, uh, <laughs> and every day it seemed like somebody new was calling me about something. They leave nothing to detail. And I just want to thank you. I really do. I really appreciate the work that you did. <clears throat> I make notes, and I, I hope they work, but I tell you, uh, usually for me, it's a sports banquet, and you see a lot of baseball players, you know, custom-made suits, and, and hair is perfect. It, it was good to come here and see gray hair, bald heads, and fat bellies, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but as I stand here, I got to tell you, my, my heart has overtaken my brain. I, 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 I can't. I really cannot ad lib. I'm almost tongue tied. You look at the honorees of tonight, and, and like the video of Barbara, my new best friend. <laughs> you're just, and you look at the previous honorees, uh, it's a humbling experience for me to be up here. I grew up in St. Louis, as you heard on the video, worked in New York. We came to Arizona 30 years ago. And we love living here. We really do. Uh, to be honored by the Historical Society, when they first called me, I said, I wasn't born here. I'm not a native. And the lady said, to, I didn't forget who it was, and I apologize for that. Uh, she said, who really is a native? There are very few. And that's great. And that's what, what Audrey and I fell in love with, as you heard, the people, the people. In New York, you ask somebody for the time, what time is it? What do I look like, Big Ben? Uh, you come to Arizona, they, they say, oh, it's 9.30, they show you the clock, you want one like this, they try to buy it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm choking up, I really am, and I, I was gonna fight it. I'm an, I'm an emotional guy, I really am. I said it a hundred times. I go to a hockey game, I cry. That tells you something, all right? But uh, when, when you get honored, like I'm being honored tonight, and I really appreciate that, uh, it means a whole lot to me because I can share it with the people who mean the most to me, and that's what makes it complete. A lot of years I've made my living with words, believe it or not. But the smartest words that I ever used was November 5th, 1949. Two words when I said, I do. I, uh, oh man. I can get up in front of a big crowd, tell yogi stories for a week and a half. I really can. I can tell umpire stories for a month and and, and I'm grappling here, and when I get through with this, my wife's gonna say, what was wrong with you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that marriage, and this is why I wrote it down. Cheap parochial school paper, I still got it. It led to the best partnership that a guy could have. We have three great children, and they made us proud from the beginning, continue to make us proud. Joe and Gina are here with their spouses. Noel is here, and Paul is here. 
We've got eight grandchildren, four are here, sat with Natalie and Chris. Meredith is in England going to school, and Natalie, or Valerie rather, is in Georgetown uh, going to uh, school, will graduate, and we're going to go up for that. And, uh, oh man, Steve and Carol, our other son, couldn't be here. He was here, but he had to go back. Uh, and uh, Natalie is here with Chris. Ross is here with Maria. And I'm about to break down. <clears throat> I'm sorry, sweetheart, but I, I can't help it. I really can't. This has gotten to me. My wife, Audrey, I've loved her for 58 years. And I tell her all the time, I said it was 60 years, because there were two years when I was trying to convince her that Italian guys are pretty good guys. So uh, she's, she's, she's the one that keeps us together. Uh, parents, when I saw that picture tonight, my mother went to one baseball game. She never really knew what, and Yogi's mother was the same way. They were immigrants, didn't speak English. My mother went to one baseball game, it was a night game because they honored me, and they did the same thing for Yogi the next year. My mother looked at the lights and said, who's gonna pay for the electricity? My brother said, don't worry about it. Everybody here paid at least a dollar. And he said, oh, then he could afford it. But anyhow, they came from Italy. And that's some of the things that I try to teach the kids down at the res, that we all got a chance. This is this great country. My father was a naturalized citizen. And oh, he was so proud when he got his citizenship papers because he loved this country. All they ever wanted from my brother and me, there were only two of us, was to be good boys. And getting this tremendous honor tonight, I think that Papa John, Mama Angelina are happy tonight, smiling, looking down, and I can say to them, I told you not to worry. <laughs> Look who I'm hanging around with now. Thank you so much. God bless you for all you do. I keep up with you. And this, and this is that framed photo, which is this photo up there. Thank you. God bless, Joe. Thank you. God love all of you. I love baseball stories. I, I did myself. I went to the Bob Euchre School of Hitting. <clears throat> it's a sort of an end joke. Uh, and now let's meet our next history maker. A lot of the work in here uh, is, uh, there's, there's studies for larger paintings that I did. And I captured a certain light and so I wanted to hold on to that and that's kind of why I have a, a pretty large collection here. Ed Mel's studio is in an old grocery store near downtown Phoenix. Uh, these are the New River Mountains, summer storm rolling over them. This is just an abstraction piece that I did sort of out of my head. This is in northern Arizona. It's called Volcanic Desert. Mel's roots in Arizona run deep. On my mother's side, she moved to Mesa, Arizona when she was one years old with her father, who had a ranch on Transmission Road, which is now a university. And a 40-acre ranch there was Supposedly some of the first citrus in the valley was on his ranch. On the other side, uh, my um, grandfather, and he was a, a bit of a rebel in Minneapolis, I think. He came to Chandler in 1923 to recuperate from tuberculosis. He soon sent for his wife and two sons. He came out on a train and my dad said as soon as he stepped off the train he fell in love with Phoenix. 
they started a new life, and his grandfather wanted a new name. His name was Carl Edgar Melchizedek, and, and when he moved to Arizona, he dropped the Catholic religion, and he changed his name to Frank Edward Mel. The Melchizedeks back in Minneapolis were never too happy. <laughs> I, every time I sign a lithograph, I'm very happy. He made it short and sweet, and yet it's a unique name, you know, probably because he made it up. <laughs> His parents met at Arizona State Teachers College. They married and raised three sons in Phoenix. Ed was the middle brother. And we were all in the arts. My younger brother was probably got the wheel, I mean, my older brother got the wheel rolling because he was... Um, you know, he was interested in mad comics and did that kind of cartooning and stuff and was very artistic and influenced me. I went to North High and uh, struggled through it. I did okay in art, although I did get kicked out of art class. <laughs> I guess you got to be a rebel to be an artist. <laughs> found later on that I was dyslexic. I think that made me a little rebellious because school was a struggle. But I always liked art, and when I was in high school, I wanted to be a car designer. That was my thing, you know. Love cars, and then I had a 54 Buick, a super two-door hardtop, which was, uh, you know, lowered in the front, kind of to look good going down Central, cruising Central. He took art classes at Phoenix College and went to Los Angeles to study at the Art Center. Ironically, I went to Art Center, which was uh, the top automotive design school in the country, in the world, really. I basically got a degree in uh, advertising illustration at uh, Art Center College of Design in Los Angeles. When I graduated, I went to New York and I um, got a job at Kenyon and Eckhart Advertising. And it was a, one of the top agencies in the Pan Am building. And, you know, it was, it was great. So it was an exciting time, you know. But I just started losing interest in it. it was, the dream still wasn't quite there. About that time, an Arizona friend asked him to teach a summer art program on the Hopi Reservation. So going from New York City to the Hopi Reservation for two and a half months is when the wheels started turning and when I started sort of seeing what I thought I might want to do. There was such beauty, the landscape and just the people, the wide open spaces, the sense of freedom. It was still a little vague and I wasn't sure, but I kind of thought I could bring something new to the landscape. In 1973, Mel moved back to Phoenix. I thought I would still do illustration. I tried to hold on to my rep in New York, but you know, in those days you didn't have the computer, so there was usually a time situation. In Phoenix, you know, the illustration business was pretty thin, so there was a lot of downtime where you could develop something else, and so I started painting a lot. You know, it's amazing how quickly things got good in my career. The first year I painted, I made $3,000 more than my last year as an illustrator. And then posters were the rage in the early 80s. You know, a poster is a big, beautiful image with your name nice and big, so that was really a... Uh, an unplanned good ad advertising. <laughs> One poster was done for Goldwater's department store. I had this poster signing and there was actually a line of people that wanted a, a signed poster. <laughs> that was very nice. In the 80s, a friend introduced Mel to news helicopter pilot Jerry Foster. Jerry saw my work passing and I said, hey, Boy, it'd really be an amazing advantage to see the landscape from, from a helicopter. And he called me up about three weeks later and said, we're doing four days in northern Arizona, pack your bags. <laughs> My first day in a helicopter of, you know, of that size was uh, landed in Sedona on some rocks and messed around there. Then we took off, landed on top of San Francisco Peaks, on the top, <laughs> in the snow. And when we went into the Grand Canyon, you fell into the Grand Canyon. Th that day ended up by uh, going into the canyon and following the Colorado River all the way to Lake Powell through Marble Canyon. 
And so that was pretty exciting. So I'm seeing all this amazing landscape from such amazing perspective. And I remember they had those Miller High Life commercials that were guys living like this and doing this stuff, you know, and it was like, <laughs> here we are, we're living a Miller High Life commercial. <laughs> After seeing the landscape that way, it's so invigorating. I mean, you got adrenaline pumping through your veins. You come back, you're excited about it, and you look at the reference you shot, and then I would take that and reinvent it and put it on canvas. Known for his dramatic landscapes, in the 1990s, Mel zoomed in for some close-ups. At a certain point, I just kind of started feeling a little bored with landscapes, and I wanted to change my palette and perspective and everything all at once, so I started doing flowers, and that seemed to take off immediately. And I, I think flowers, I think one of the fascinating things is the translucence of them and, and the light coming through them is what was uh, something I enjoyed playing with and see if I could make it work. And, and the two really are a nice balance for me and I like going back and forth and it keeps me, as soon as I get bored over here, I can go back here. I mean, I, I, I eliminate a lot of uh, unnecessary information, I think, in my work. Uh, and trying to get down to the raw bones of it, uh, sort of what you'd remember in your mind almost, rather than what your eye really would see. Mel's work reflects his love of the West. His work includes horses and cattle. He also creates sculptures. In 1985, I did my first sculpture. And I got that, the large piece at Scottsdale, uh, in Scottsdale at Main and Marshall Way. In 93, I did that piece and it was, I felt very fortunate to get it. It was, uh, it was really fun to do. And I just did a Phoenix bird for the city of Phoenix, a 40 inch one that they have uh, over in uh, Cesar Chavez uh, Mall there. It's another discipline. And when you're tired of painting on a two-dimensional surface, it's very nice to just, you know, grab a piece of clay and see what you can make out of it. Mel is proud of his public art. One of his favorites is his Karchner Cavern painting at the Visitor Center. Returning to Arizona was the best thing I ever did. I have a career where most people, when they meet you or glad to meet you. It's, I don't think a man could ask for any more than that. And I have a great city that has embraced my work. I think there's a frontierness to being a painter. Just trying to find something new each day is always an exciting thing, making something out of nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, Ed Mel. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as you notice, I had a few hairstyles in that uh, video. But right now, it's just another ball guy. <laughs> but uh, it's, you know, uh, and I also am a native, <laughs> so there is at least one here. Um, I, um, grew, when I grew up here, I, it was a great place to grow up. At a certain point, I got a little uh, kind of bored and antsy, and uh, a good friend of mine, Mel Abert, who's here with me tonight, we went to high school and junior college together. He went off to, uh, to uh, art school, and he returned with this He'd grown so much that I had to follow in those footsteps and went to a great art school. And then, as you saw, I went to New York and had a great time there. And, but uh, coming back to Arizona has just been great. It's embraced me so well. You know, it's treated me wonderful, and I'm a very lucky man. Um, I'm lucky to be here with my mother, who is here tonight, and who has moved to Arizona in 1915 at age one. <laughs> along with my wife, Rosemary, and my family and friends here at my table. I'm a very lucky man, and I thank you very much for this honor. I couldn't be prouder. Thank you. Thank you.
there's a certificate here. And, 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 and here's that frame. Uh, here's frame picture. Very good. I, I go back a long ways with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Ed's older brother, Frank. We attended Phoenix College together in 1956, and um, we were on the newspaper staff. I was a sports writer, and, um, and he was the cartoonist. So uh, go back a ways, and, and I, uh, I had another. Oh, yes, one of, one, of Ed's, uh, one of Ed's works is right here in the rim uh, uh, at the right here at the Western Kierlin Resort and Spa, so uh, where the it's it's right behind the bar at the rim there. And let's see, I have oh I had some other news. A mutual friend that uh, Ed and I have traveled some of the back uh, parts of Arizona. Um, Bob Bose Bell. I've had several people ask me tonight how is Bob, and many of you saw in the paper that he suffered a heart attack in Kingman the other day, Sunday on Sunday, and I worked with him at True West Magazine, and um, Bob uh, uh, had uh, two stints on Monday, and then had two more on Wednesday when he had a, a serious setback. But um, the last word I got is that he, he, uh, his wife did bring him back to Phoenix from Kingman. So he's got a little recovery time here, but, but uh, he'll be him, his old self here uh, soon, we hope. Our prayers are out with him anyway. And now let's meet our next history maker. Elizabeth Ruffner has dedicated much of her life to preserving historic buildings in Arizona. She grew up in Ohio and went to the University of Cincinnati with dreams of becoming a doctor. I had ambition when I was in college. I was going to be a physician. I was going to be the best there was. Then she met Budge Ruffner from Prescott, Arizona. Was told by his father, it's time to go to work now, son. You need to get serious and get this mortuary science degree under your belt and come back to Prescott and run the mortuary. When the year ended, he came back to Prescott and enlisted in the United States Army Air Corps to avoid being drafted. Draft was imminent in those years. And I enticed my mother to take yet another trip. My mother and I stayed in the Hacienda Hotel for that first week. And by the end of the week, Budge and I uh, decided that we would tie our fates together and we were married in on um, August 10th of 1940 in Prescott. Prescott was a small town in those years and Elizabeth made it her home. She got a job in a doctor's office. I grew up a lot in those years, uh, living alone, husband in the air, away in the Air Force, a new child and a job, uh, doing everything the doctors needed doing. The women of the town came calling on me as soon as I was settled in their white gloves and calling cards and told me what they had in mind for me, which was that these new young women who come to town had lots of volunteer opportunities. We needed, they needed help with the Girl Scout Council. And so it was easy for me to fall into the volunteer part of my life. They also said we needed a new library in Prescott and that was the major task I took on. Um, we were in the wonderful Carnegie Library on the corner across from the Asiapo. Over the time, it was very important that we expand. The building was long outgrown. We had resolved all of those years to keep the library downtown. The new Prescott Library was opened in 1974. A block and a half from the Courthouse Plaza and in a perfectly wonderful location. And meanwhile, before the library, before the city Prescott Public Library vacated the building, the librarian and I had gotten enlisted in the National Register of Historic Places. The U.S. Bicentennial in 1976 got people thinking about history. In Prescott, Elizabeth found a town rich in history. It traces its beginnings to gold mining and cattle ranching and was the first capital of the Arizona Territory. I was appointed by then the governor, Williams, I guess, 
to the State Bicentennial Commission, and that really got us looking at Arizona's history. And it got me looking at Prescott's history before demolition became the only alternative. The Yavapai County Courthouse was one of the first buildings nominated for the Historic Register. Uh, one of my signal su successes I still recount is moving the Bashford House. An owner of a beautiful, wonderful Victorian mansion was, had contracted with the Ralston Purina Company to build a jack-in-the-box on our main street. We got the state to buy a corner, which was occupied by a, an automobile repair shop and a liquor store, and demolished the liquor store and moved the Bashford house down the street, down East Gurley to West Gurley, and plop it down on the corner in Shaw Hall Museum. We got a bicentennial grant. We put together a committee, raised the money, moved the Bashford house, and did the survey of Prescott's historic buildings and then published a booklet called Prescott, Arizona Territorial Architecture and went on from there. Over the years, my husband and I have been asked to run for everything from dog catcher to president. And we've always resolved that we would stay private citizens and learn as much as we could about one area which interested us and be a good volunteer informant and supporter of actions. Not one to rest on her laurels, Elizabeth's current project is to restore the Elks Theater. And I am secretary, I'm assistant treasurer, and I'm chairman of the capital campaign. The Elks building was first opened in 1905. Well, the Elks were going to build a building. The people of the town had just lost their last opera house to a fire. And the people of the town went to them and said, we would like to have an opera house in your building. And the Elks said, okay, we'll figure out how much that will cost. And the figure of $15,000 was brought up and the people of the town raised $15,000. And the architects for the Elks building included the theater space in the building. Everybody has used this as a venue over the years and we're proud to see it continue. I've been raising money for 60 years. But I believe this may be my last major project, and I will rest on my laurels when we get that Elk Sapa House restored and back in business. Elizabeth has received numerous awards for her years of work, but what is her proudest achievement? The historic preservation of the downtown, the historic preservation of the town. There are more than 800 buildings listed in the National Register now. Also, I think maybe my greatest success is the Hacienda Hotel in Prescott. I've worked over that for a long, long time. So I'm really proud of the Hacienda. I think it's worth the effort it's taken to keep it alive. With the Elks right across the street now, it's a double satisfaction. If it's worth doing, then the local jurisdiction takes on the role of historic preservation, and the Courthouse Plaza always became the focus. Without imagining that center, the rest of it was not as easy to hold together in, in a piece. Buildings don't exist just because they are handsome or old. They have to have a purpose. Some of the Prescott buildings she has worked to preserve include the Santa Fe Railroad Depot, the Sam Hill Hardware Company, the Prescott Post Office, the Arizona Pioneers home, and Fort Whipple. Why does she continue to work so hard to save historic buildings? Because I have something to give. I may be the only one who knows how to do this or cares how to do it. Uh, experience and also that I'm that kind of a person who has kept busy all of my life, extremely busy. So it's that connection with others, which I think is a secret of happiness and the very presence of all the marvelous people in my life whom I've met and known over the years has made an ideal life and I'm happy to have lived it and somehow have made a difference somehow. She made a difference. That's the way I like to be remembered. Ladies and gentlemen, Betty Ruffner.
My great thanks to all of you who are here and to the history makers, the Historical League for giving me this wonderful honor. I didn't need all these men to get me on this platform. I just wanted you to know how many wonderful men I have in my life, <laughs> including Martha. I like short after dinner talks. My new best friend, Joe, did a wonderful one. It was longer than I would do, but it was every bit of as wonderful as anyone could say. When Sandra O'Connor appeared at a book signing for Arizona Facts and Artifacts, she said, am I a fact or an artifact? <laughs> Same question here. This honor is really wonderful to me, and a great number of friends and family and acquaintances have honored me in various ways. One woman wrote and said, you should be a future maker instead of a history maker, or in addition to a history maker. Another one sent me a card with a photograph of Monument Valley, and she said, you're nearly a monument. <laughs> I'll just leave you one with, with one profound thought. Youth is natural. Aging is an art. Good night. Good night. Is a certificate from the Historical League. Thank you very much. Thank you. I might add, Betty Ruffner's picture hangs here in the Weston, Weston um, Kierlin Resort and Spa uh, as a culture keeper in the Charter Group of 2002. Every year from 2002 until statehood comes in 2012, um, we are honoring here 10 Arizonans each year so that in the year 2000, 2012, when Arizona is 100 years old, there will be um, 100 Arizonans' photographs hanging here being honored as culture keepers. And Betty Ruffner was a charter member of that group. Her husband, Budge, was one of the greatest historians I ever had the pleasure of working with. When I was just a young historian, uh, he mentored me, and I, he, he, he doesn't know how much he mentored me because I just watched him and studied him. He was the greatest storyteller I ever saw. And every time I tell a story to little kids or, or at a convention or something, I always think about how would Budge have told this story. Uh, Betty, I have this to say, I wish you had been in Ash Fork, Arizona, instead of Prescott, because they just tore our town down, and, and uh, what didn't tear down, burned down, so anyway, um, but then I digress. <laughs> and now let's meet our next history makers. The Snells have devoted their lives to making Arizona a better place. Dick's father, Frank, came west in the 1920s. Came out here sort of as a last lark on the, between uh, law school and, and going to work, and uh, out to see his, uh, his uncle in Globe, Miami, and uh, loved it so much he just stayed. Adios, Connecticut. His mother was a teacher in Globe. After they married, they moved to the growing town of Phoenix. Dick was born in St. Joseph's Hospital and grew up during the Depression. But I went to Kenilworth uh, in uh, elementary school and then to North Phoenix High School. I was certainly thinking about law, which is what my father was doing, but I was also thinking about agriculture. Summer jobs, I had worked in farming and ranching. And Stanford had the attraction that it was called the uh, farm. So that's where I went and I found out very quickly that was incorrect. So I then uh, sort of turned my sights on the law. Dinky Snell's early years were in Silver City, New Mexico. During the war, her family moved to California, where she graduated from high school in Hemet. Well, I, I got a couple of scholarship uh, loans from the Hemet businesses and, uh, and got several jobs at Stanford, room and board, and research for a minister in town, and reading to uh, blind law students. 
She majored in political science, and a roommate from Phoenix introduced her to Dick Snell. We didn't really get together until, until uh, both of our last years. We started off to a movie in San Jose, and, and he s took me all the way to Hemet to ask my mother for my hand. Now, is that nice? They married August 1, 1954. That was a busy summer for Dick Snell. Got a great past the bar, got married, off the arm. Well, I went to uh, Fort Benning for uh, what was called a basic, uh, basic industry officer's course. Along with the rest of my class, got shipped out en masse to uh, Germany. He went to Germany, and then as soon as they could figure out a way to get me over there fast enough, because they didn't let you travel, or in those days they didn't let you travel when you were on the verge of having a child. But we made it. So she joined me in Germany when we lived there the better part of two years. I never thought I'd go to Europe. And so, I mean, lots of, lots of people that I knew were going to, hear, to Europe after graduation, but I wasn't one of them. And uh, this, was, this was better than that. It's a wonderful experience. Keep in mind, this is the Cold War. It was really at its hottest, I guess you'd want to call it. It was hard work, actually. But I must tell you, it was uh, the best learning experience of my life. I learned to follow and to lead. I think I'm a dramatically better person as a consequence. When they returned to Phoenix, Dick went to work in his father's law firm, Snell and Wilmer. Well, I was at the law firm for 25 years, starting in uh, 1956. Fairly quickly gravitated to real estate and did that for uh, several years. But after that, I gravitated much more strongly toward uh, corporate finance. And Dinky began to work as a volunteer. Dick's mother, Betty, was taking me around, showing me uh, what she, things she was involved in. And uh, I finally realized that what she was doing was getting me to pick some, something I could do. Uh, she said, we always give back. So I got down to business and picked something. <laughs> I, I worked at the, as, on the auxiliary at Good Sam because they had, they had a nursery. and Karen could go there, and we, we, I did that for years. That was the beginning of my volunteer career. Bread for the blind, recording for the blind. I think that was a highlight. I'm proud of the of the work I did at the at the at Samaritan. I was I was one of those token. I, I was the age to be a token woman in a lot of things. So I was a token woman on the board of trustees at Samaritan. Dick Snell's career went in many interesting directions. A lot of things in the business world I picked up as a lawyer because of the, what I did, and the corporate finance and stuff like that. Ramada N. named Snell president and CEO in 1980. I think my background uh, in corporate finance, which is basically what Ramada needed at that time, my understanding was that I would do that until the end of that year, which would be 1981, and then report back to the board as to what I, uh, where I thought I ought to go from there. Pinnacle West was another company looking for help. I joined uh, Pinnacle West in February of 1990. They were in uh, financial stress at that time due to the Mayor Bank. Uh, uh, they owned the Mayor Bank SNL, and along with all the other SNLs in the country, there was a, a crash. As he worked to help corporations in trouble, Snell also used his expertise on many volunteer boards, such as the YMCA and the Phoenix 40. Freeways and transportation were always issues. The hot issue at the time I was chairman was Rio Salado. That was when there was a fairly broad program for developing the river. Oh, I thought it would have been a great thing for the city. It would have been a unifying deal. When Dick left the YMCA, he willed me to them, and I was there for a number of years. I was chair there. I think I, on their 90th birthday, I was, the, I was made the first women chairman of the Metropolitan YMCA. Education has always been important to the Snells. I believe in public education. Uh, so I went through public schools, as did my wife, and, uh, and so did our daughters. In 1990, Dinky Snell ran for superintendent of public instruction. She had worked at the Arizona Department of Education for five years. It was a statewide job, though, so I went all over the state and met a lot of people. It was, it was nice, nice, nice experience. 
All except for the losing. <laughs> there was, at first there was this jolt because I'm competitive, but then it was, whew. After the end of her political career, Dinky continued her commitment to education as a volunteer at Arizona State University. After I got involved at uh, ASU, I was re really hooked. I'm on a couple of advisory committees, dean's advisory groups, and it's been a very enriching part of my volunteer career. Uh, Dick and I co-chaired their last capital campaign. I think that uh, ASU's got great potential along with Phoenix to make major strides in the world. They see a bright future for Arizona. As philanthropists and community leaders, the Snells focus on setting an example for future generations. I thought that if I was a good mother and a good wife, uh, they were, the rest was icing. I'm most proud of my marriage and my daughters. Oh, I, I, generally, I think that I've uh, served the community well, and I'm, I'm proud of that. I've received more than I've given. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard and Dinky Snell. Somewhere along the line, they promised us we wouldn't have to say anything tonight. So you weren't going to get a long one. Uh, thank you very much for this honor. Coming at the end of that string, I'm, I can truly say I'm humbled. And uh, I'll let Dick say what, how he feels about the whole thing. And for those of you who know me, I will give my speech. Thank you. Richard, Dickie. I have these certificates here for you, and, and, the, and the photograph. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies, would you check your ears? Um, I have a gold earring up here that was given to me uh, at dinner. And uh, with the price of gold now, about $940 an ounce, I'm hoping there aren't any claimants, but I would rather the, the owner have her earring back. So if you're missing a, uh, a pretty gold earring, um, I'll, I'll hold on to it. And um, I guess I'll, it's probably best, because you can always find me at Scottsdale Community College. But uh, uh, here it is, and I'll be around for quite a while tonight. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight to honor six these very special individuals. At times like these, it's well to remember the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson and our own late Ginger Hutton, features writer for the Arizona Republic for so many years. Emerson wrote, the purpose of life is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and have lived well. And Ginger Hutton wrote, we are all each other's teachers and the greatest gift we can give anyone is the example of our own lives. Let's give our history makers another round of applause and thank you all for coming. <laughs>